So I walked in the room and uh, Deviant was cooking and I'm thinking, why the hell am I speaking? Let's just continue cooking. <laughs> I was also considering just going across the hall and leave you guys in here, but here I am. So hacking the invasion of things, or as my wife calls it, what did you spend our money on this time? So, so uh, as he said, my name is Daryl Hyland. I'm currently working as the research lead for IoT technology at Rapid7. I've had that role for a little over a year now. Uh, for those who are not sure how serious I take my job, this is my car. <laughs> my other junky car, she says IoT on, on it. So, uh, Recently, I was, uh, had the great privilege of actually being on ABC World News, which was totally cool. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but if you look right there at silver objects sitting right there, a uh, history buff, war buff, military buff, that's actually a bolt from a PPS-43 submachine gun. Uh, <laughs> I forgot to take it off the shelf. I removed most of the other stuff from the room, so uh, that's probably a good thing. They probably wouldn't have put me on TV with some of that stuff that was sitting in the room. So uh, the invasion of IoT. I think most of us are probably aware that there's this massive invasion of this technology taking place. You know, it covers everything from wearables, you know, lightings, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, power management, audio, video systems. We figure we'd just do a couple, couple sample things here and show you some other stuff. A lot of people don't take into consideration how evasive IoT technology is. So let's see if I have the stuff I need to do this. Okay, cool. So, so with my tablet here, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick look at Bluetooth low energy in the room. So as we quickly see is the a number rack up. And here it's not nearly as bad. Uh, I did a presentation late last year and there's, it's still coming. There's more and there's more and there's more. But this is kind of small. I did a presentation last November where I did a demo uh, uh, attacking Bluetooth pairing. And I figured, you know, I'd fire this up. I'd show everyone the invasion. And then I'd, like, do the presentation. And there was, like, 2,000 devices on my thing. And I was, like, for five minutes trying to find my device so I could attack it. <laughs> so it was pretty insane. So it gives you an example, you know, of... What's going on around you? So if you, uh, this is NRF Connect, so it's something you can put on your phone also. Just fire it up and take a look at what's going on around you. So many of these Bluetooth low energy devices have a number of vulnerabilities. A lot of times they suffer from various pairing issues. We're actually going to do a demo here a little bit uh, of uh, an issue with a certain type of device and pairing problems with it. And of course some other vulnerabilities are associated with it. So let me go ahead and jump back over to the slide deck. So, uh, like I said, there's this crazy invasion of things going on. And so I go out and I like to buy different things and I put them in my lab and sometimes I get time to hack on them. So I have a couple devices I haven't hacked on yet, uh, but actually used it. You know, you ever been in that situation where you like sit at work, it's lunch time and you go, damn, I wonder if the eggs in my refrigerator are fresh enough to eat tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So now you can. So you have this device here, it's probably going to fire up and try to connect to Wi-Fi. Because I actually tried using it. I put it in the house, my wife opened up the refrigerator. She's like, what is this in the refrigerator? I said, well, how the hell am I supposed to tell how fresh the eggs are unless we track them? <laughs> Doesn't work very good. There was a number of eggs that were like, you know, it kept saying there was an egg there and it wasn't an egg there. It kept going back every morning and it never did show up. So. So it's not very accurate. So I was on a trip this week, uh, and I was at IoT World. Uh, this, I didn't find this at IoT World, but I was on the phone with a wife, and she goes, oh, you got a package. I'm like, a package? What did I buy? I said, open the package up. So she opened the package up, and, 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 and in it was a pregnancy test. So this is a Bluetooth pregnancy test. 
I haven't started hacking on it. And most of you guys, if a wife opens up a package you have and there's a pregnancy test in it, you're going to be in serious trouble. She was not surprised. <laughs> she goes, a pregnancy test? Bluetooth? That's insane. Why would anyone need a Bluetooth pregnancy test? So I'm going to try to find out. Not now, later. Uh, you may be able to set it up. So, so, so look, you know, looking at this technology, and we'll do this in a minute, you know, how do you approach testing this type of stuff? Because we also got to remember uh, IoT is more than just a simple device. There's other pieces that make it function, as in the cloud and, and mobile apps and stuff like that. So how do you solve these problems? The only way to solve these problems, of course, I'm a researcher. The answer is research, right? So in come the researchers to the rescue. So what are we trying to do? You know, trying to solve issues. Uh, that's how I kind of look at my role. You know, because we have this new technology that's moving into our day-to-day -day lives, every aspect of our life. So we need to approach it in some fashion. My approach is actually doing research. So I can help things like vendors, you know, manufacturers, consumers, and try to make sure all these vulnerabilities are discovered and removed from the products. So they're not out there and end up being used by somebody in, in an evil fashion. And I look at a lot of different things, and we're going to go over some of them, hopefully we have enough time to go through all of them today, uh, based on the research that I've done over the last year. So it's like four items that I've actually published stuff on. I have a half dozen more things working in my lab right now. So what's this do? It, I think it adds value. If we can help solve these problems, and we learn knowledge from this whole thing too. You know, we find out what are the common issues, so we can quickly approach or communicate that out to manufacturers. And they're able to go, oh, gosh, let's, let's fix these issues. Let's remove all this low-hanging fruit, these stupid things, uh, so that we can get down to the more complex vulnerabilities that may exist in an, in an IoT environment. And I think that's critical. So I think I'd better serve everyone with my research. So moving from there, how do we approach IoT research? As I mentioned, it's more than just some device. There's a whole ecosystem that ties these things together. So when we decide we're going to test this technology, we need to look at the whole ecosystem. And this little diagram kind of displays that. It may include mobile applications, or in some cases, some kind of command and control. It can be an application on a server, a laptop, whatever it may be, but some kind of remote control management type functionality. For most consumer goods, it's mobile applications. Cloud, you have cloud services, cloud APIs, that all tie into it also. And then you also get into the hardware, the physical hardware. And this is all tied together with various network communication methods. It could be Ethernet. It could be Wi-Fi. It could be Bluetooth low energy. It could be Zigbee, Z-Wave. The number of protocols just continues to grow and grow and grow in the area of IoT technology. So the goal is, is when we look at a technology like this, we look at that whole ecosystem. Because something in the cloud could lead to a problem in the hardware. Something in the mobile application could lead to compromise of the cloud APIs. So you have to look at them as a unit, as one cohesive piece, if you're actually going to properly evaluate the security of any kind of IoT technology. Often uh, researchers see a lot of cool stuff come out, but they always seem to hack just the hardware. You know, they find good stuff. They spend a lot of time, put a lot of research in it, and that's really cool. But, you know, what about all the other pieces that make that product function and work? What other vulnerabilities exist in that environment? And that's kind of, as a researcher, the focus I like to take. So we've built this whole testing methodology structure as we approach uh, assessing any kind of technology. It's functional evaluation. So literally, I'll take the product and use it. I'm not sure how this is going to work. <laughs> I'll find a way. So then we look at the product, how it works, how it functions, and we kind of map out that whole ecosystem. What are all the pieces, what are all the parts, and how they work? You can't really test something unless you really have a solid understanding of its full functionality and how it works. From there, we do device recons. Most of this technology is made up of pieces and parts of other technology. There may be an embedded web, app, web server in the device. Is that web server have known vulnerabilities about it out there? So that type of thing. So you do recon on all the pieces and parts that make up that ecosystem. From there, we go on and we look at like the cloud functionalities, the APIs, 
and how they're working, how they test them. We would run them through, you know, typical web application style testing. But while we're doing that, we take in consideration machine to machine communication, going to the APIs, or mobile app communication uh, to the APIs. Uh, from there, we also look at networking. What kind of services does this device expose? This one, obviously, is Bluetooth low energy. So you have to look at it from a Bluetooth low energy. We'll, we'll set up, we'll get the device working, we'll man in the middle of the Bluetooth low energy with various tools out there. I'll use things like Ubertooth. We'll capture all that communication, we'll analyze it, we'll look at it. From there, we also look at physical hardware inspection. I'll take this device and I will literally cut it apart. We'll take all the pieces and parts out of it. If I can get the firmware from the vendor directly, perfect. If I can't, I'll pull it off the device. I'll do whatever I need to hook up to it. I'll pull the memory, pull the flash chips, put them in a holder, hook it up, dump the flash data off the device, and, and go to that level. We may use JTAG, uh, you look at UART. I mean, we'll actually show some of the stuff tonight, hopefully. Uh, and then we get into physical device attacks. Again, does this device expose some kind of connectivity service physical on the device? You know, are they storing, are they storing the flash encrypted? If it is encrypted, is the keys stored there? Those type of things. So get into that physical tax. Can we get UART connections? Has the JTAG fuse been blowed or they left it connected and giving you a possibility to hook JTAG or serial wire debug up to the device? and go into, start debugging the, the processes or pull memory or stuff right off the CPU. Uh, and then we get into radio RF. In this case is Bluetooth low energy, but we look at all of it. If it happens to be Zigbee, Z-Wave, um, Insteon protocols, custom protocols that may exist out there, we'll use various tools, analyze the RF, that type of thing. So that's kind of the approach we like to take when we're looking at these devices, and that way it's, I think it's fairly thorough. Uh, and that brings more value when you actually look at the device in its operational environment and you look at all the pieces and parts and how they all interconnect with each other from a security perspective. So, that's when some of the fun should start. So, uh, so we're going to cover these four, it's actually five devices, but four devices tonight. We're going to look at a home enterprise automated lighting solution that released a bunch of vulnerabilities for last year. We're going to actually look at a Bluetooth low energy tracking dongle. You know those things you hang on your keychains? As harmless as it may seem, uh-oh. Not all of them are harmless. Uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, some findings when I was looking at a telepresence robot. I don't know if you've ever seen these things. They're like freaking cool. It's like an iPad on a Segway. You drive it around the office. I found out we had one of those at the Rapid 7 office. Guess where it's at now? <laughs> They haven't asked for it back yet. Somebody will see this video and like, Daryl, send me my damn telepresence robot back. I may. And then a GPS panic button. I think the story behind this is probably more funny. Uh, well, I don't know if it's funny. I thought it was. The people at FX may not think it was funny. So let's go ahead. Look at automated lighting solutions. So the product we actually looked at was um, Osram Lightify, Savannah Osram Lightify. I got one. So I have I have the home model right here that's got like funny wires hanging out of it. We'll touch that here in a minute. And then uh, the interesting thing, there was an enterprise version. This is not for sale in the U.S. yet that I know of, but it was for sale in uh, Europe. And this is used for lighting buildings like this. This one had some uh, interesting findings uh, that we'll talk about. So let's see what the next slide is. Okay, so looking at that whole ecosystem, we like to look at all the pieces and parts. So uh, looking at the Lightify system and looking at a mobile application, we find that it was storing the WPA pre-shared keys and the SSIDs on the device in clear text. So you could just pull them off. The amazing thing is, is the mobile app doesn't need this information. This is used for the initial setup. After that, it doesn't need it anymore, so why is it even storing it there? This is a very common problem. I think most of the IoT technology we run into, we find these kind of issues. Data that's being stored that may not need to be there, finding passwords, usernames, uh, certificates, keys, things like that that are not encrypted. And a few vendors do it right. I still encounter some vendors that actually do it right, but most do not. Uh, this was an interesting one. So both these devices are Wi-Fi compatible, or capable. 
And the one on that side, no, this side, I'm not good at left-right things when I'm backwards here. So the one on this side over here happens to be the home product. So if we look at that, it's 10 characters. Hopefully you can see it. So it's a 10 character password. This is a default password on this device. They're different on every device, which is a good thing. But it's the default Wi-Fi to capture, connect to the Wi-Fi. Truthfully, that's not all that bad. Uppercase, lowercase, numbers, 10 characters. It's not perfect, but for a default, it's probably not bad. So we go over to the other side, and this is an enterprise side. This thing's capable of Ethernet and Wi-Fi, and at the same time, So well, the first one I got, I'm going eight digits. That's really bad. And it doesn't seem like to be a lot of different digits there. So I got a second device. I talked to him and it sent me a second device. It turns out it's only hex. It's the 16 characters, one, zero through nine, A through F, lowercase, and that's it. We crack this in like two hours and the device becomes a access point. Uh, at that point. So, total fail. Uh, they said they fixed it. They haven't sent me any other products, so I can't really confirm that. Uh, so, this one, this one we're going to have a video. So, uh, I, I know people have seen, hopefully some people have seen my previous research that I've done dealing with SSID injection attacks. Okay, so th this is the configuration console on the enterprise level product. So let's go ahead and fire up a video, and then I can explain it. This one was just uh, literally safer to do as a video. So, so if you go into the uh, configuration of this device, you can set up various Wi-Fi connectivity capabilities. And it's going to show you all the Wi-Fi's that are in close proximity to you. So you can see we have two Wi-Fi's that are showing up. Well, we need a third one, right? So I'm gonna give you a third one, and it's gonna be my own special one. So we're actually going to send embedded tags out as an SSID name. Now, this works, this works pretty good and works on a number of products. I'm always finding this vulnerability. So we, we're having a little fun with it there. Shut up. So we had a little fun there. This is a safe example. It doesn't scare people. But if I can execute this, what else do you think I could do? Remember the person logged into this thing as an administrator. Uh, there's a number of things. We can create our own IDs on the device. We can set up, change the Wi-Fi wi configurations. We can change the environment configurations. We can also pull the unencrypted uh, unencrypted configuration of the whole thing off the device and send it off somewhere else also. Uh, there's a number of attacks. Uh, there's cookie-based attacks, so you can do session attacks against them. So the list is on and on and on of the various attack things that can be carried out by publishing your own special SSID to do fun and evil things to devices. Uh, this is, uh, I wouldn't say this is common, uh, but I wouldn't say it's not uncommon in technology. So any device that actually, because I know everyone's going to go out and try this, you're going to look at all your shit at home. I know. So anything where you fire it up in the web console and it actually shows SSIDs of all the devices near to you, fire up a soft access point on a Linux box and go ahead and see what it does. You may be surprised. Okay, so um, when, you're, when you're doing tests in these devices, one of the key things is you want to get into the hardware. You really want to look at the hardware. So we kind of opened this home device up, and we see there's two landing pads. So the only natural thing is to actually connect something to them. This is all for perspective of size. So this is, so each one of those would use half of this. This is a gall wing, one millimeter pitch connector pin. Um, so, we go ahead and we s solder those up. It was funny, I showed one of my friends, and uh, he's like looking at it. He goes, damn, how'd you get that soldered on there? I can't even see it. I like, cheat, I have a microscope. 
I'm over 50, come on. <laughs> Trouble seeing my hand in front of my face sometimes. So yeah, so my lab has a microscope. It makes that type of work way much easier. Uh, so it makes a lot of fun. So then we can hook up to it at that point. And, and that's what, exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and hook up to this so you can see the type of information that's dumped off these devices if you get that level of access to it, uh, which is easy. It's called cutting the box open. So let's see if we can get this hooked up. I think I have it ready. So we use screen. Uh, we're using an actual Shigra. Let me just bring this over here. So, so let's bring it over here. So this is a Shigra device. Uh, and we're just hooking up to the UART on the, on the product, plugging into it. So I'm thinking if I could do this without shorting everything out, starting to fire up here, we'll be fine. So when I plug this thing in, if everything works, we can actually watch the entire device boot up. Now we don't get a full control of this device, so it won't get a full you know, root level privileges to it. Uh, it doesn't have a full operating system, but it brings up a small command subset on the device. So it's blinking away here. And what it's trying to do, it's trying to find its Wi-Fi. So it's trying to uh, connect out to the Wi-Fi. Uh, it's not gonna find its Wi-Fi. And that kind of brings us to another tag. But if you watch this go by, uh, you'll see some interesting stuff. You'll see username, password, SSID information, uh, connecting data to actually connect out to the internet to authenticate itself to pull like firmware down. So it finds all kinds of stuff. I don't know if it'll show that when it doesn't connect it, but I think it did. So it probably showed that data. So we'll go ahead and let that spin for a second. Can't remember if I have another slide, this or not. Wrong one. Okay, so that brings us to uh, another interesting thing. When you're dealing with IoT technology, whether it's enterprise or whether it's consumer base, we're mostly used to it connecting to the cloud. That's how you do command and control. That's how you turn your lights on when you're halfway across the country, uh, which I could probably do right now at my house because uh, I use most of this stuff. I actually use these products. So you can turn uh, the Wi-Fi on and off remotely. It goes to the cloud. Well, what happens when the cloud goes down or the internet goes down? Well, that's one of the things we take into consideration when we're evaluating a product. Often you'll find the product drop to local mode. You may not know it, it may not tell you, but it'll drop to local mode. Because obviously, what good is this technology if the internet goes down? Most vendors realize that. So if you're home and your phone's connected to your local Wi-Fi, it'd still be able to nice to turn your heat up, you know, turn your lights on and off, all that type of functionality. Often though, when it drops into local mode, there is no, no security whatsoever. And that was the case with this. It goes over port 4000, uh, and this is just basically an injection package. It gives us the ability to change the SSID and the pre-shared key, uh, WPA pre-shared key on the device which we'll go ahead and do and see if we can actually see it uh, connect up. So to be able to do that, don't do that. What is the Wi-Fi? Oh, here, let's try this. Is that messing me up? What is the Wi-Fi? Uh, for the building. Anyone remember what it is? Is it, it does it go by Carolina Con 13 or it was I thought it was the building. I figured everyone would know. Just Hilton. Hilton underscore comp. All lowercase. Is that correct? What's the, uh, what's the uh, password? Oh, CarolinaCon is. So is that correct, CarolinaCon 13? 
Okay, what's the, what, what is the SSID? Hilton Comp. Okay, what's the password? Oh, so there's no password? Okay, so I'm not sure what this will do then, so. Capital H, capital C? Okay, we'll give that a try. Okay, and a dot at the end. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, let's see what this does. So, so we can kick this thing off. Couldn't connect to target. Okay. Yeah, that's because uh, I turned my Wi-Fi off because I don't trust any of you. Okay, so now we're connected. Let's try this again. Couldn't connect the target. Oh, don't tell me you don't have a thing. Well, you always have to have one demo go to shit. Well, we can go on. See if anything shows up. Yeah, I know why it's not doing it. We can fix this real quick. Don't ask me how they got turned off. Let's see if it'll see it now. Okay, so it sent off, it connected, at least it sent it, you may be able to see it seeing, connecting to home network, so it's tempting to go back out and connect to the home network, and now it's barking again. The thing is, is uh, if it could get all the way out to the site, then the lights would all turn green, and I was hoping that would get full access, so, um, but as you can see, now we're able to, without any authentication, just by sending the appropriate commands to the device. Uh, we captured all that communication so we could figure out all the command structures basically by monitoring that, that communication on 4000, run the whole product through all of its series of changes, configurations, we're able to map out the entire command structure. At that point you're able to inject commands into it. If you're able to gain the network level access to the device, an attack like this would be, obviously this is a home system, just a sample, an example of what could possibly be done. But in this case here, if you're you know, at your friend's, friend's house and he's running this stuff and he lets you on your Wi-Fi, just send a command and Wi-Fi jump off and connect to the neighbor's house. So I don't know if that'd be funny or not. <laughs> I think it would be funny. Of course, he probably wouldn't be a friend of mine after that, would he? So we know how that goes. Okay, so let's jump back over here. I think we're still on schedule. Any questions so far? Okay, cool. Go on. Okay, so now we're going to get into uh, BLE dongles, or uh, you lost your keys. Again, un un unauthenticated access, uh, a weak BLE pairing, uh, information leakage. This is a number of flaws we found. Uh, so we looked at, I looked at like four, four different products. Uh, the one that's probably the most popular that had the most problems was uh, the Tracker Bravo. Anybody have this? chicken. <laughs> I always have to ask when I do this demo because if I pick the wrong device, uh, well, not, not, I wouldn't say bad things happen. So the way this, the way this attack works is, uh, let's, go ahead, let's go ahead and bring up the Wi-Fi stuff again. So we should be able to Close this thing up so that it's uh, closed up and it should be running now. And uh, let me go ahead and do refresh on this. And there's the tracker, FAD2. So we can jump over here and look at this. And there's, uh, 
hopefully everyone can somewhat see that. There's a number of interesting things here. Well, it turns out this ID and I, uh, device ID for the thing happens to be the ID that's used to manage this in the cloud also. So now you have tracking information of the device. So the next thing is, is what do you do from there? So this is going to switch over real quick. Well, I want to want to try this again. Ah, now you all get to find my password. One, two, three, four. I have to change it all. <laughs> now I got to change my Facebook account. Damn. <laughs> so if we come over here and uh, to Bluetooth, and we see the tracker there, and we pair to it. Uh, so now we pair to it, um, and it didn't challenge us. There's no challenge. There's nothing. It just paired up. So now that we're in there. Let's go ahead and fire this back up. I want to do a refresh on that, bring that back. So we come down here on the pair and we go connect. Sometimes this is quick, sometimes it isn't. So we're able to connect up. So the way the attack would work is you come into a room, you do a quick scan, you've identified a tracker device. Somebody has a tracker. You don't know who that person is but you pair up to it anyhow. You come over here to immediate alerts and you select and you send. Now you just look for that person that's panicking to shut the damn thing off. <laughs> and now you know who has it. So if I leave it on, which obviously if you're wanting to screw with them, you would, um, but it will drain the battery really quick. This thing will probably beat for 10 minutes and it's going to be dead. I've killed way many batteries just playing around. So, so we have that. So uh, the vendor fixed the other abilities. Obviously, I don't know if they fixed their new line of products coming out to solve some of these problems. Uh, but uh, the problems that made this worse was the cloud APIs. So we jump over to Cloud API. All we had to do was take that tracker identifier. I got it blocked out here. And now we can get your latitude and longitude, and we can track you forever today. Huh. Nothing safe or sacred, is it? <laughs> I actually have the tile. Anyone use the tile? The tile's a pretty good product. I actually like it. It's not real with problems. Not that there's probably not problems in there. But uh, it's, it wasn't riddled uh, like some of these other ones were. So as you can see, you know, you could use a simple device as this with common, simple vulnerabilities. These are not complex vulnerabilities. And generally, track somebody. Or at a, at a bare minimum, if you get the identifier, you just wait long enough until after dark, and you probably know they're at home, and you can figure out where they live. Uh, that would be easy enough. So um, it's kind of a scary thing. Now, the way, the way I look at this, and the way I, I explained it to reporters, if you are a nobody, I am a nobody. You probably don't need to be overly scared of this. If you happen to be a politician or somebody in, in, in a high visual state uh, where people care about you or don't like you or want to do evil things to you, then having technology like this on your possession is probably not a smart thing to do. So, so then we get to the telepresence robot. The only sad thing about this was I, I couldn't take it apart. Oh, that's a $3,500 piece of equipment. Not that I didn't try to figure out how to take it apart, but there was no obvious screws to take out. Uh, and I couldn't find, there was nothing on um, FCC website on disassembly. Uh, it showed the thing disassembled, but there's no way to identify how they disassembled it. So I couldn't take the thing apart. So I had to limit some of my attacks to external type stuff. And the way this device works is, I mean, it has a, had a number of interesting issues. The head's nothing but an iPad. Simple. The rest of it, you buy the iPad separately, you plug your iPad into it. It runs standard software like a mobile would. Uh, you use their website to log on. This device, when it's fired up, connects out. The crazy thing is, even though this thing's physically wired down to here with a plug, they connect from here to here with Bluetooth. 
okay? So if you have one of these things in your company and somebody powers off the head and doesn't power off the bottom, you can connect to it and, and do like really crazy things with it, like run people down with it. <laughs> it doesn't run that fast though. <laughs> Probably a good thing or I would have hurt myself with this thing. I fired the thing up at home the first thing when I fired it up to test it up, took off across my lab, hit the wall, spun around, smashed into the floor. And I'm like, oh, I destroyed it already. But uh, it survived. I was able to get it back on its uh, wheels, and uh, we moved from there. But we started looking at the cloud APIs. Now remember, uh, as we're going through this, uh, this, is an, this was a research project. So when you're doing research against cloud APIs, it's very limited what you can do uh, from an ethical and legal standpoint. So I could look at my data coming from my robot. And I could look at how that's affected by trying to affect my robot. Okay, so understanding that type of stuff, how, how do we move from here? Well, it turns out, and I blacked out some stuff because it's like bad stuff. But we found out that over here where this offset, offset is, we could just put a number in there. And I found out if you put a really big number in there, it would come back and say, that offset doesn't exist. The highest number is blah. So I know where our cap's at. The way this works is when this thing fires up, it creates a session out there. All that session data is tracked right here. So everybody that's connecting out to this device, this number, high number is changing constantly. So I, I initially discovered that. We Eagle, you know, what can I do? So we devised a way to, uh, uh, you know, follow, you know, proper ethical security standards. And what we did was uh, I attempted to, when I fired the device up, I would check the highest number, I would fire my device up, and then I'd make a quick step until I identified my, I don't know if it's showing here, but it actually model number. It'll show the actual serial number of your device. As soon as I found my serial number, now I can look at my data, and then I can play with this data and go, okay, what does this data mean? We weren't able to get full control of the robot from here. There was some, there were some pieces within the robot, some communication in the robot. Anytime you man in the middle, it would go down. Not all of it. It was communicating to two different locations. If I could have got the second piece, it was all encrypted, probably man in the middle, I would have probably gotten more data out of it. But we're able to get a good bit of data here um, by walking this offset number and identifying that. And things we were able to get, uh, I don't know if it shows it on there, but uh, yeah. So here's another offset. Uh, one of the other settings worked the same way. We are able to identify our robot. In this case, here's the serial number, and here is the actual GPS coordinates. So literally, by changing these numbers, this offset, you could walk through and identify people's robots and their GPS coordinates. And, and of course, once you got the GPS coordinates, you plug it in, you figure out what company owns it. Thank God for Google Maps. <laughs> you know, takes you right down there and tells you who actually owns it in a lot of cases. Obviously, if it's a very dense place, you may not get the exact people, uh, but you can get a general idea who owns it. The last one was a little more complex attack, but potentially more impactful. Uh, in this case here, we found out the robot was communicating back to, uh, well, the cloud APIs was communicating back to the uh, head of the device, and it was sending this data right here, which is known as a robot key, okay? And this robot key was used for controlling it. So for this attack, you had to man in the middle of the communications, for one, to be able to carry this attack out, or have some kind of physical access to the device, and you can identify the robot key. With the robot key, without any authentication, you have the key, go anywhere, fire that at the API, and it would dump back the screen right here with a driver token. The driver token is a fixed token that is created any time a new user is set up. That token never changes for that user. It's always valid forever. That token will let you completely, fully take over the robot remotely uh, over the internet. So, so it's kind of one of those things. Now they fix this. They set it up so that when you put the driver token out there, it doesn't return all that data. The only thing that the robot needs is the username. So when you're setting up the device, you go, who has access? It'll list the names. That's all you need. You don't need that token. 
and that's what was sending back. So the fix was remove so that token doesn't come back. Uh, but you know, as testing this, this is exactly what I did. I was able to pull this data down and then log on to, log on to the website, completely separate account to do with all this, um, and use that as a session token. And it switched over and this robot showed up on my screen. I was able to take it over remotely. So shows how physical security uh, or big part, good uh, encryption. Obviously, it was encrypted well, but we were still able to man in the middle of it by you know, putting the certificates, uh, the man in the middle certificate on the device. So a lot of physical access to the device, but it kind of makes you think about some of those technologies. It's complex, but if somebody wanted to do something evil and they could get the device or in your workplace, they had a chance to play with the device, they could easily pull this data off of it and six months, a year down the road, you know, hey, I don't like that company bring up the robot and run it around the office and yell at people. <laughs> Try to terrify them. Yeah, yeah, that it would probably have the ability to do that. Of course, it would only work if it was wearing a black hoodie. You got to remember that. Someone was wanting me to put a black hoodie. I, I remember who it was. I think it was ABC News. One of the guys doing the film crew. Let's put a black hoodie on it. No, I don't think so. <laughs> So the next one we get into, and, and we're getting short on time here, uh, and I'm not sure if we'll be able to do all the tests, is the GPS panic button. This one has an interesting story behind it. It, it is a poor design. Uh, the way the device works is literally, you press this button, it will call out the three different phone numbers uh, with those three phone numbers and connect out to them, and the person on the other end will be able to hear you. So if you're like screaming bloody murder, they'll know you're murdered. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and it gives them the GPS data. And the way it works is through SMS messaging. That's how it's set up, that's how it's configured. So you're able to control the entire device there. So where this becomes interesting is, is uh, actually Associated Press contacted us and said, hey, have you guys ever seen these devices or messed with them? We're like, no, we hadn't. And he goes, well, the Colombian government is actually telling people to buy these. The people they're telling to buy are people that are in danger of, let's say, being kidnapped by Colombian drug lords, okay? Or uh, the media, mainly the media, because the media was using it. And what's the effect of it? How secure is it? Is this something that should be used for that purpose? So we brought it in and started looking at it. And, uh, well, that's another, another thing there. So we brought it in and started looking at it and tearing it down, and we found a number of interesting flaws on this. Uh, there's two pieces. There's this, and then there's what's known as real-time tracking, which is a website, okay? So this device is capable of communicating to the website. It uses a SIM card. So you put a SIM card in, and you buy, if you, if you buy data services, then you can use the real-time tracking because it passes the GPS data there. So as we started playing around with this, we tried to find a couple interesting things. Is One was, you know, how can we, because you can set a password on it. It's a, a PIN, so it's a six-character PIN that you put on it. And once that password's set, I can't identify the device anymore, even if I know the phone number. I can't tell what's there. I can't get it to return anything through SMS messaging. Well, I took the firmware out of it, started digging through the firmware, and found out another command on the device. The command didn't work, but the command returned a format error message. So it instantly gave me a chance, the ability to fingerprint a device. So if I had a series of phone numbers, hey, we know everyone in this particular city that's using these devices, this is the typical cell number base, we could just war dial it, we SMS messages and identify these devices. Uh, the other thing we found out, and this is, this is like the, the really bad part, is that if you send an SMS message, you send an SMS message to this thing with reset, all uppercase and uppercase explanation, formats the entire device. Goes back to factory defaults. There's no way to shut that off. Fully remote via SMS messaging. So that, that, and that one's kind of crazy. This thing is feature rich. So at that point, you've wiped it. He hits the panic button, nobody gets called. You can send an SMS message and it's going to reply back with his GPS coordinates because all the passwords have been removed. You can send another SMS message, turn off all the lights, turn off the vibrator, 
send another SMS message, turn it into a remote listening device, one way. You can hear everything that's going on on that end, they can't hear nothing on your end. So, at this point, I'm pretty sure I'm no longer welcome in Columbia, South America. <laughs> By either party. The government's probably hacked at me, and if the Colombian drug lords knew about these crappy features, they're probably mad now because everyone threw them away. Uh, or at least I hope they did. Again, this is one of those, uh, the best way to, to think about this from a risk perspective. If you bought something like this for your elderly parents for their safety, you don't need to worry about it. If you bought this for your kids, you typically don't need to worry about it. If you bought this to be protected from being kidnapped by Colombian drug lords, it's not a good idea. <laughs> Bad move. <laughs> so moving from there, uh, some of the other things we found on the device. This was a, a bounds check error. Not really an attack, but a, an example of we could send an SMS message to configure the phone number. So it's A, B, C, three phone numbers. We found out it wasn't limiting the bounds check. So you could send an extra long phone number and write, overwrite another phone number. Just a, a sample of some bad design on how, how the thing works. Uh, so when we move to uh, looking at from the cloud APIs, this thing communicates GPS data out over ports uh, of 70 or, uh, uh, 75 or 7050. Yeah, 7050. And it's all non encrypted, clear text, out over the net, internet, this thing sends out which is probably not a good thing. So I had to screw with it. So I went ahead and wrote up a program and uh, I basically made my device move to Moscow. So, so now I can poison the data. So I mean, you start adding these things all up uh, and it gets to be pretty, pretty crazy. You're able to take over the device, alter it, move the device to somewhere else. So if someone was using real time tracking, you just shut all that down. Uh, you've made the device look like it's in some other place of the world or country or city. Uh, it, real safety hazard for people that are high risk to be able to use in something like this. Also moving from there, we also found out the website uh, for real-time tracking. Uh, and I'm not even sure if any of this has been fixed. Um, hopefully they have fixed uh, most of this stuff on the website, uh, but I typically wouldn't hold my breath on that one. So in this case here, we're able to actually harvest data. Uh, without any authentication. So you can barely make it out here as a user ID. So we post to this URI a, just a sequential number. I register account, it gets the next number in line. Register account, gets the next number in line. Now I know the number, starts at one, goes up to this number, feed this into a script, identify everybody, identify everyone on the face of the earth using any of these devices and their GPS coordinates. So, uh, yeah, not good. So we found, we found several other issues uh, within the product. Uh, we found out with a valid account on the real-time tracking, I can go in with a valid account in a similar type issue as this, I could actually alter or reconfig someone else's account, their device remotely via the web interface uh, without even having to have SMS messaging. So, again, uh, some serious issues. Where this lead us to? Well, it's real simple. Uh, I work for Rapid7. Uh, we're very big on ethical disclosure. So we have a coordinated disclosure process. And the way that works is we contact the, the product vendor. And we give them all the information. And we make every effort to contact them. We take this very seriously. These are security issues. Some of them could affect people's life and safety and health. Uh, so in cases like that, we take it very seriously. Uh, 15 days into this thing, we go ahead and we notify CERT. And if we still haven't been able to get hold of the customer or the people that produce this thing, CERT will typically help us out and sometimes they can help out uh, tracking people down. We usually contact them ahead of time. You know, if we don't get the person a few days, we contact CERT. We just don't get CERT to details. But 15 days in, we give CERT to details. And then what we do, at a minimum of 60 days from the time we've contacted the vendor or attempted to contact the vendor, we'll publish the information. Okay, that's a very minimum. A manufacturer comes back to us and says, you know, this is very complex. Our process chain for getting this stuff and rolling this out or that out is going to take us, you know, another 30 days, 60 days. This is complex problems. We work with them. Our, our job is security, not insecurity. So we'll continue to work with them. So the whole disclosure process, which 
often can freak people out. Uh, it's not a negative, not at all. I mean, think about this. All of these manufacturers here got free work. We help make their product better, in my opinion. So, and vendors care about that. We rarely encounter vendors that take a negative action, reaction to us. They're usually very positive now. Now, that wasn't the case a decade ago. Things were quite different back then. Uh, we help get issues resolved. Uh, consumers protect it, the way I look at it. You know, this published without an AP. It was published in Columbia, South America. So people who may have been a high risk had a chance to be notified that the product they're using may not be as safe or secure as they thought it was. So the consumer's um, identified and gets that information in some cases through standard media. Uh, and in my opinion, everyone kind of wins with that whole approach. We win because we gather knowledge. Often this is done to help expand knowledge around IoT, IoT security, IoT technology. That helps our customers directly, you know, at Rapid7 that come to us and go, hey, how do we approach, you know, getting something fixed or testing something? We have a whole methodology around that. So that helps there. So in conclusion, you know, kind of what do we learn? Daryl can't go to Columbia, South America now. Um, you know, and, and, and what are the answers? And in my opinion, the answers are, you know, exactly this. Let's do the research. I mean, a lot of you are security professionals. You may be into research. Do ethical research. Work with the vendors. Help them fix their products. That way we can make the whole, whole world hopefully more secure. You know, with IoT being this emerging technology, things are changing really quick. Uh, these things are showing up in our cars, medical devices. It's, it's serious. So uh, when you're thinking about security, do the ethical disclosure thing. If you happen to find something and you're not sure how to go about doing that, contact us. We will, we will take you through the entire process. We will publish it for you. Heck, if you even want to talk to the media, we'll set that up sometimes. Uh, for, for And that way it goes through a good ethical disclosure process uh, and everyone's safe and secure because of the good process. And I think that's it. Any questions? Thank you.